All right, good afternoon. Welcome to another lecture of Chemistry 401. One of the handouts today is the updated calendar in light of all the events that have been going on. Um, and uh, one of the things you will notice is that the discussion for this week is titrations, not whatever it said it was. Those of you who have discussion directly after class today, if you did not bring your titrations handout because you did not know, I have copies available for you. Otherwise, if you brought it, great. Um, otherwise, uh, the subjects, of, uh, a couple subjects have changed or moved around a little bit. But anyway, this is our new schedule, so you know what to bring and you know what lab to expect. Um, it does skip from experiment nine to experiment 11. So please, please pay attention to that. We have homework number five passed out. So what we've just, uh, what I've just been willing to do for you and another bit of input from students and try and pre present the best educational experience to you. Will be worth five points due at the exam only based on completeness and you will have the key as soon as I make it or maybe not that soon but certainly by the time you turn in homework four. Maybe even sooner than that actually. There is as almost always a plot required, and you must make it in Excel, you still have to do that for full credit. But you know that. Well, where were we? Uh, we had finished chapter 17. We were about to start chapter 18. Chapter 18, ther thermodynamics, the uh, science of energy transfer, just like it says. What we're going to talk about in chapter 18, we're going to use the term spontaneous a lot, so we're going to start with that. A spontaneous process, A, a process that occurs without external influence, B, a stretch rubber band will spontaneously contract. This is not the sum full total demo, but this is, most of my demos go about this intricate. Done. Did, did it contract? spontaneously. In order to stretch it, I have to do work not spontaneous. I release my force, my, my holding it. It contracts. A stretched rubber band, band will spontaneously contract. So that's example one of a spontaneous process. Not chemistry related, but physics related. All right. So C, chapter 15, 16, 17 definition, a chemical reaction that occurs in the forward direction has a large K value. Actually, that's not correct. QC less than KC, that's the definition of a spontaneous reaction before this because it doesn't matter what size K has, KC, KP, KA, KB, could be a really small number. If QC is less than KC, that reaction is going to spontaneously occur in the forward direction. I apologize for that. Hopefully that makes more sense than in the reason why we know. Example, is this a spontaneous process if the concentration of carbonic acid is 1.00 molarity and carbon dioxide is 0 0.01, and it has a KC value of 30 right there, we would calculate QC, First power, everything looks good there. Our QC is 0 0.01. QC is less than KC. Reaction will spontaneously occur in the forward direction. QC is less than KC, reaction will spontaneously occur in the forward direction. So the first thing we want to say is that chapter 15, 16, and 17 dealing with equilibrium, equilibria if you will, and chapter 18 are dealing with the same subject. We're going to use some different terms and we're going to use some similar terms as we talk about it. And we just want to touch base with what we've already done. 
Any questions so far? Chapter 18 definition, a process that lowers the free energy of the system. That is going to be our new definition of a spontaneous process. And uh, we'll start with this statement, nature is lazy. Nature, chemical reactions, etc., anything really, always moves to the lowest, well the term we've used before was the lowest energy state. We're changing that by inserting the word free, and everything will now move towards the lowest free energy state. And we'll talk about what that means. So nature, chemical reactions, everything really. Moves to the lowest free energy state. shouldn't be a period yet. The word I want to put in there next is spontaneously. Now I can put my period in there. And the next thing I want to say too is that equilibrium, the thing we've been talking about in chapters 15, 16, and 17, equilibrium is the lowest free energy state, as we will see. Equilibrium is the lowest free energy state. And it'll turn out that free energy, more or less, only matters when you talk about science, like physics and chemistry and biology. We'll talk about free energy quite a bit. If I was to talk about the free energy of this pen, it's actually simpler not to think about free energy and just think about energy in general. We'll add the free energy part because it'll be important mostly for chemistry and then biology and then somewhat in physics as well. Anyway, but so your fallback position, like just like in Chem 400 moving to Chem 401, everything we've already told you is true. We're just going to the next level on this energy thing right now. That's what we're doing. All right. Now, uh, E here is going to talk about spontaneous versus reaction rate. We're going to differentiate chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18 from chapter 14, which were kinetics. So that's the first one. Chapter 14 was kinetics. And for spontaneous, whether we talk in terms of uh, thermodynamics chapter 18 or QC versus KC, you're always going to determine if a process is spontaneous first. And hopefully that makes sense because spontaneous and move which direction you're moving towards in equilibrium means will it happen. After you determine if it will happen or will it, it will happen, then you can start thinking about the rate and how fast it happens. So then determine how fast it happens. That's kinetics. Then you can think about it, or then you can determine how fast it happens. So, okay. Any questions? Okay. Well, I'm delighted to uh, then continue the conversation 
uh, talking about uh, spontaneous reactions and the fact that they tend to do two things. They tend to disperse energy, and under disperse energy, we're going to put first, exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous. Exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous because they disperse energy to the surroundings. <coughs> and the surroundings in the system, these are terms we started in Chemistry 400. In Chemistry 400, I suggested, and we'll still do this in Chemistry 401, that we will focus on the reaction, which will be the system, and then when the reaction has a negative delta H, that's the reaction giving off energy, and that energy is going to the surroundings. But I focus my discussion of thermodynamics on the reaction, and then we don't talk so much about the surroundings, but that's where the energy is going. Another way of dispersing energy is to disperse energy to different energy states. Uh, so, and we're going. This is one of the things we're going to talk about. But if uh, we've talked a little about this in general with Boltzmann distributions of gases. And if you remember back to Boltzmann distributions, we said that the gas in a room, this room, any room, has a wide variety of energies. And not a single energy. And that's going to be related to this. So there's going to be uh, dispersing energy to different energy states. So matter, or what's this? The same amount of that matter with more energy states is dispersed energy. Colon, the same amount of energy with oh, uh, spread over multiple energies. Hold on, I screwed that up. The same amount of matter dispersed over multiple energy states. The same amount of matter dispersed over multiple energy states. be more dispersed energy, and that will tend to be spontaneous. B is a little different because it mentions energy and matter, and so we'll have to think about that as we go. But in general, more dispersed will tend to be spontaneous. Two, I'm, I'm going to talk also just strictly about dispersing matter. Dispersed matter is matter that is more spread out. see if I can get it to play. Gas in the filled flask will move spontaneously to the empty flask by its molecular motions. Eventually, the distribution of molecules will be even throughout the flasks. The final state in which the matter is more dispersed is much more probable than the initial undispersed state. So an example, a uh, animation, if you will, of dispersal of matter. So do I have the picture with the matter in both sides on your handout? 
Or no, there's no picture on there, is there? All right. So the picture you want to draw, if you're going to draw it, well, we'll draw lots of these, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Dispersed matter is matter that is more spread out. Matter that is more spread out, or spread, dispersing matter tends to be spontaneous. Question, Travis. Do you think dispersing matter tends to be spontaneous, say matter tends to uh, disperse itself naturally, or it's those things that lead to a more spontaneous reaction than those chemicals? So matter tends to disperse itself. Okay. So no, aside from reactions. Yeah, and, then, and this is nice. So there's no reaction going on here. You open this valve and matter disperses itself. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about how matter disperses itself uh, through reaction as well, but there needs not be a reaction. All right, so I think it's time for the demonstration. Demo, contracting a rubber band. So here's how this demo works. We've already talked about the fact that as a rubber band contracts, it is spontaneous. Yes? All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, stretch the rubber band and hold it for about 15 seconds at approximately the same amount of stretching. And then you can watch this, if you will, and then do it. I want you to take the rubber band, place it on your upper lip, and then, without letting go, allow it to contract against your upper lip. On your marks, get set, go. And tell me, does your lip feel warmer or cooler or no change? Do it again. Or actually, do it this way as well. And tell me either way. When you go this way, you should feel a little bit of warmth. When you go, and if you let it equilibrate and then you go like this, it actually should feel a little cooler. How many people can feel that? All right, many of you. Question? Why does it feel cooler if you just move the rubber band? That's exactly what we're talking about. But the first part is, so you have a stretched rubber band. You can, it's gonna spontaneously contract. Now, that's one part. Contracting rubber band. Now let's think of energy. When we think of energy, right now we're talking delta H. If, as the rubber band contracts, your lip feels cool, that's a lower temperature, what is the rubber band doing? The rubber band is taking energy from your lip, meaning taking energy into the rubber band is the contracting of a rubber band exothermic or endothermic? <coughs> it is endothermic. So delta H, so lip feels cool as energy is removed from it. That energy goes into the rubber band. Conclusion, 
the contracting rubber band is endothermic. Or, yeah, the contracting rubber band. And yet, the contracting rubber band is spontaneous. And it says right here, dispersed energy, exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous. I have an endothermic process, not a reaction, but a process, an endothermic process that is spontaneous. <coughs> so let's say that contracting rubber band is endothermic, uh, which tends to not be spontaneous. Yet, this process is spontaneous. Okay. Is that just due to the nature of the elastic? Like, is it so elastic? Or is that? So, it, is it due to the nature of the elastic? The short answer is yes. The, the next question is how, though? And now I have to relate it back to dispersal of energy or dispersal of matter. I'm gonna relate it back specifically to dispersal of matter and say that disperse or dispersing matter tends to be spontaneous and I'm gonna to attempt to prove to you, nothing on my sleeve, that as the rubber band goes from here to here, the matter is dispersed. And then after this little demo, we will then quantify with numbers what I mean by matter dispersal and we're building up to the concept of entropy, which is a little bit of a complex concept. So we're starting here. But that's what I'm gonna try and convince you of next, is that I'm dispersing matter, which tends to be spontaneous. Even though endothermic tends to not be spontaneous. And then we'll talk about the competition between things that tend to be spontaneous and things that don't, and who wins. So, anyway, so then, Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to draw for you underneath there on the left the rubber band in its stretched position, compare it to the rubber band in its not stretched position. In the stretched position, well, rubber bands uh, are polymers. They're typically rubber from the rubber tree was a specific type of polymer, I would guess that all rubber bands that you buy today are not actually rubber. They're more better, they're better called polymer rubber bands. And we're gonna approximate polymers by the simplest polymer, polyethylene, which is just a bunch of carbon chains. And so here's the polymer in its stretched position. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember from our, did we do the polymers lab last semester? Yeah, we talked about polymers. And those polymer chains are extended and pulled taut. They have no degrees of freedom. They cannot move. That's hard to tell from the picture, so that's why I'm gonna write it on it. So these polymer chains are extended and taut. taut, tight, they can't move. They can't really move. And you might be able to feel that because you've pulled the rubber band like this and then they can't really move very much. 
Whereas when the rubber band's loose, they can move around more anyway. Very few positions. And now over here we have the contracted rubber band. And maybe just as a first approximation, I'll show you that they can move around. There are lots of positions that each of those uh, carbons, or each of those polymer chains can hold. When I attempt to draw it, the way that you can tell that they have many positions is that they are not what are called stretched zigzags. And so I'm going to ball uh, these two points are now much closer to each other. And it's just going to look like a jumbled mess. But And I don't know if I can convince you of this with these pictures, and that's maybe why I'm moving this around in a dangly kind of fashion right now to attempt to convince you. But each of these polymer chains has many positions. So these polymer chains could be right here, or they can move a little bit, and they cannot move here. Uh, I don't know. Many states, and that's a term that we're going to start using. I'm introducing it now. I'm just saying that this rubber band could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And even though they're closer together, because they have more positions, they are more dispersed. So this is the more dispersed state. More dispersed because more positions, more states. Question, Marissa? So the definition you have that dispersed matter is not as more spread out, but is it actually matter that has more space? Question. It's, uh, the definition I have is matter that is more spread out. Maybe we need quotes around that because, no, you're right. We're getting to the fact that it should have more positions, more states. develop this idea further. Nice addition. Thank you, Marissa. Because actually, spread out doesn't work here. Actually, they're closer together. I get it. Any other thoughts or questions? I think that's most of what I want to say there. Yeah. Now we're going to start talking about entropy. Entropy, a measure of the dispersal of matter of a system similar but different to disorder of matter. Oftentimes entropy is associated with disorder and sometimes, or actually many times, it, that is a good working analog for entropy. We're going to delve into that a little deeper. We'll start off with the idea that entropy is a state function. What does it mean if it's a state function as to the pathway between the beginning and end points? Does it matter how it goes from the beginning to the end point 
as far as the change in entropy. It does not. That's what a state function means. And what it means chemically for us is that if we start with reactants and end with products, it doesn't matter how long it takes or what path it takes, we can think of the energy of the reactants, the energy of the products. In this case, the dispersal of matter of the reactants and the dispersal of matter of the products, and we don't have to worry about the in-between phases. What happens in between? So uh, entropy is a state function. Value of entropy only depends on initial and final states. Here comes the heart of the definition, however. Entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases with the number of energetically equivalent states to arrange the matter. Enthalpy is a thermodynamic function that increases Entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases with the number of energetically equivalent states to arrange the matter. And before we get to symbols and units, there's one other thing. Do you remember for delta H? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Delta H, we said, there are no value, true, uh, sorry, there are no absolute values of the enthalpy. We will only calculate changes in enthalpy. And so we use this delta H formation thing. Each of the elements had their own zero. For example, delta H formation of oxygen gas was zero. That's different for entropy. Entropy, there are absolute values. And um, so what I'm going to put up here next is called the third law of thermodynamics. You do not have to know that name. goes like this. The entropy of every pure, perfectly crystalline substance at absolute zero is zero. So that's the end point. There's no dispersal of matter at zero Kelvin. There's no entropy. The entropy of every pure, perfectly crystalline substance is zero. Zero entropy at zero Kelvin. If it's pure and perfectly crystalline, in theory, you don't have to be in that state at zero Kelvin, but if you are, your entropy is zero. <coughs> Symbols and units, well, capital S is entropy. S naught is standard molar entropy. And S naught is going to be tabulated in your conversion equation sheet just like delta HF. 
and we'll be able to work with them actually just like delta HF values. Question? What's an example of a perfectly crystalline substance? Um, good question. I think, well, let's start with just a crystalline substance. A crystalline substance would be something like sodium chloride, salt. Right? You get a little crystal of it. And what I would say is, on a very small level, it might be perfectly crystalline. And then, even in its crystalline state, though, those little sodium and chloride ions are moving. And what happens as you get closer and closer to zero Kelvin is that those that kinetic energy goes away, you know, decreases. And so if you have a crystalline substance, it won't be perfectly crystalline because they'll be moving around. And then as you get closer and closer to zero Kelvin. So I, I actually think if you had a salt crystal and you froze it down to zero Kelvin, it'd be a pretty good example of that. Right? So they're just crystalline substances. I mean, I don't know, salt. Sodium chloride, oftentimes, depending upon how it's made, might have some potassium and iodide in it, in which case it wouldn't be perfectly crystalline. But if it was only sodium chloride and chloride ions, it would be. Does that answer your question? All right. Uh, Just like delta H reaction, we're going to be interested in calculating delta S reaction. Um, and this will be products. Well, I'll just write it out. The sum of all the coefficients times the standard molar entropy of the products just like for delta H, minus coefficients times S naught of the reactants. And again, we'll do this quite often. Not quite yet. Uh, it says units. I'll give you units next. And even though they should go down here, I'll put them up here units. Joules per mole Kelvin. Now this slide is entitled Entropy, Matter, Dispersal, and Microstates. We've talked about states. And the only difference, they're still states, but they're going to be for just a very small number of particles. That's why they're called microstates. If you deal on any real basis with the gas in this room, you're going to have moles of gas, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That would be a macrostate. This is going to be a microstate, hopefully, and I have my fingers crossed, to help you understand entropy. All right, we said this, increased entropy equals increased dispersal of matter equals tends to happen equals tends to be spontaneous. And here I have an initial state, and here I have possible final states with a little valve in here, similar to the gas example I showed before, and at the beginning, we have four particles in this left one. And in the end, we could have four in the left, four in the right, or two and two. At least as some of the possibles. There's also three and one. Three and one. Or three and one. So there's two, there's two states shown. And there are four particles. One, two, three, four. Are those numbers big enough so that you can see the one, two, three, four on your handouts? Maybe. Just barely. We'll have to work on that. And the question is, why do gases expand to fill all the available space? And the answer is because the entropy increases because there are more microstates. 
And what I'm trying to say is having four in the left or having four in the right, there's only one microstate. But having two and two, there are six <coughs> microstates. And I'll take your question uh, now, Elliot. What's a microstate? Is it different from a state? Good question. What's a microstate? The answer is, it's not different than a state. I guess the only difference is we will actually put like four particles as opposed to like a regular state that we study in chemistry has moles of particles. So think of a microstate as just a close-up that allows us to think of the number of states. So for example, if we put a mole of gas here and tried to count how many different ways there were to put it in, we couldn't do it necessarily. We'd have to have some high math. So think of this as a proof of concept. But otherwise, it's no different. I don't know if that, does that sort of? Yeah, I think it makes sense to me. It's like, what's nice about this, and then I'll take your question, Kate, is if we have four particles, then I can actually have you plot out all of the states and draw them. And if you look at homework five, that's exactly what you do. It's just a way to differentiate this kind of perspective from another. Okay. Yes, and Kate and then Hannah. Question? Oh, what about three to one and one to three? Oh, so we haven't shown those possibilities, but those are other possibles. Oh. Shall we do those? Okay. Hannah, before we do those, do you yeah, want to ask your so question? In the six microstates, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering why, why, are the, why are the gas particles kind of like positioned differently? Oh, good question. Why are they positioned differently? These two are one and two at the top, and the bottoms are three and four. So we're actually moving individual oh, particles. Yeah, sorry, that's hard to read. That's fine. So it's like the placement? It's like I'm placing one and two here, and then one and three, uh, yeah. So I'm systematically moving the particles to get an idea about the states, okay? All right, so now, Okay, your question uh, was, what if there's one particle in left flask? And I apologize for this. Instead of drawing flasks, I'm just going to draw a circle with a line connecting another circle. And now I'm going to actually use the numbers. So particle number one is right here. And two, three, and four in the other one. One, two, three, four. <coughs> now two, and one, three, four. And if you have these microstates, you can do this totally to get an idea of what's the most dispersed matter, and the dis most dispersed matter, the matter that has the highest entropy, will have the most states. That's where we're going with this. Now, if you see, I can keep going. I'm putting one particle at a time in the left, and I'm putting all the other particles on the right. Now there are three, uh, there are four states. Now we can do three in the left flask. How many states or microstates do you think there will be? There will be four because now I'm going to put uh, one, two, three, and four in the in the left, the right flask, and the other three in the left.
put one particle on the right one and the other three go on the left. And in fact, they're the same four states except the right and the left are flipped. Four states. Also called microstates. Four states. And six states. Which has the highest entropy according to what I'm telling you? The one with the most states. Six is the most. And therefore, it is the highest entropy and most likely to occur. Isn't the bottom one the most likely? Well, the bottom one has one and three versus three and one. Those are different. There are eight states, but I would say, well, are these two the same? Yeah. Or are they different? And so what I'm going to suggest for now is that they are different and that... Well, so are these different? Right. No, these are all the same. Those are two, 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 two. This is one state. And what I'm trying to convince you of, and we're working on it, I'm working on it, you're working on it too, is that with two in each of them, that is the most dispersed and most likely state. Just like in that picture before where I had a gas in one bowl, and it moved over so that equal portions were in each pole. If these are different states from these, then having a third of a mole and two thirds of a mole in those two flasks would be different states as well. And I'm gonna suggest that that probably, well, we're working on it, but with a gas, a mole of gas, you would guess that half and half was the most probable state. And that one third of the gas versus two thirds of the gas would be different and less likely to occur. It is more likely to occur if it has more microstates. One microstate, a different microstate, Let's come back to these. If I have four in this, and I open this valve, what are the chances that all four of them are gonna go over here? Don't they technically even out? Don't they technically even out? Yes. That's what I'm trying to convince you of. <laughs> Why do we divide what up like what? Like this and this being different? Yeah. Aren't they the same so they're marrying each other? Let's do a different thought experiment. <laughs> Let's say this room has air in it and the hallway doesn't. Would it be a different state if all the air was in here or if all the air was out there? Would, that, would you experience that as a different state? That's what I mean. I mean that this one is different than that, and that these are both very unlikely. It's, and it's harder to see that because there's only four particles. And so I would suggest that these are also different states and less likely than this. And in the same way that if we had a room right here with air in it and a room out there with a vacuum, 
with no air in it, what would you expect the final state to be? Exactly half and half. And all the air in here versus all the air out there would be different states. And I see that difficulty, and I don't know if I've convinced you, but where do we want to be with this? I want to convince you that when you think about these little particle things, that the state, that these are all equals, these are all the same because they've all got two and two, that these are different, and that the ones with fewer microstates, states in general, are less likely to happen. One state, less likely. Like, I would, and, and what we can say actually is that this state is six times less likely than this. These two states have equal likeliness, and both of them are not very likely. These are a little more likely because they have four, and this is the most likely. But I have to convince you for this to work that these two are different states and that these two are different states. I'm still not I'm going to call this state two in the left, and then they're all two in the left. That may or may not help. Lauren, did you have a question or a comment? No, I'm mostly like trying to explain to people because um, I kind of grasped it. So. I mean, where we're coming at this, we, you know, which is interesting, I think, is we know what the answer is in macroscopic systems. We know that there should be equal amounts of stuff in two different places. Like if there's, if I had a warm cup of coffee up here that coffee, the smell, the aroma, or a big bag of popcorn. Could you smell it in the back eventually? Yeah, bring your own popcorn. And that's because things spread. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand why that is. And it's a process. But the, the, the underlying thing is entropy will quantify that for us. And we're lucky, some might say, because we have big tables of entropy values for actual chemical reactions, and we're just trying to get and understand a little bit more about where those numbers come from. So how about, at the risk of getting everybody more lost, we move on and then we can come back to this again. So the idea, yes, Anna, is to uh, use the concept of microstates to understand dispersion of matter, start to quantify it, and then move back to those s naught values and hopefully understand them more. It's a process. It's an amazing. So now we're going to put an equation to it. It's a very famous equation, the Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann was an interesting character, brilliant. You've heard his name in Chem 400, you're hearing his name in Chem 401. Nobody believed him, and so he committed suicide. And then years after, everybody was like, oh yeah, he was right. Seriously. 
I mean, he was probably, I think he had depression anyway, and, but, but he, he died not knowing that people would eventually believe his theories. Because they were theories at the time. They were not, you're talking about microstates at a time when people didn't even believe, so a lot of people didn't even believe atoms existed. Right? Because they're in, 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 so he had to believe that atoms existed and then think about their positions at a time when a lot of people didn't even believe in atoms. This is a late 1800s, before quantum theory, before a lot of stuff. Anyway. Um, anyway, he came up with this equation. It's on, it's actually on his gravestone, his little statue, too. His little, um, but. Couple things. This is little k. Little k is something different than the rate constant. Little k in thermodynamics is called the Boltzmann constant in his honor. And it's equal to R 8.314. over Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And here I'm going to write microstates per mole of microstates. We've seen this before. You can have a mole of electrons. You can have a mole of photons. You can even, way back in the day, have a mole of atoms or molecules. These are going to be microstates per mole of microstates. That gets the moles to cancel out there, by the way. And this is probably a little like, this is probably a little deeper than most Chem 401s go into those types of units. I love units. Right, so see those moles down there in the denominator of the denominator? And see the moles in the denominator of the numerator? We're going to end up with joules per microstate Kelvin. And then, just like when we were talking about um, energy of photons, sometimes the microstates that, or you know, the, the the actual number of photons or per electron didn't show up in the units. Most people don't even have microstates in there, but it's true. It is there. Next, what is W? W is Wahrscheinlichkeit, which is, as you might have guessed, a German word. <laughs> that largely means probability. We don't need to know that. What we need to know is it stands for the number of energetically equivalent ways or states states, they're all equivalent thing or equivalent terms to arrange the components of a system. Okay. So there's that definition that's related to um, energetically equivalent ways. Right. And so let's see, we have uh, 1, 2, plus 4 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 6. We have 16 possible ways to arrange these four atoms. There are 16 possible microstates. Mm -hmm. 
the probability of getting four in the left one sixteenth probability or one out of the sixteen states over here we get six out of sixteen probability and another definition or used a way that W is used that is as the word probability but you can see that the number of microstates and the probability of the microstates are related to each other they're just divided by 16 of each other anyway so what we can do and we'll do it on the next one is actually calculate the entropy of these Oh, sorry, we have to finish up on this one for a minute. So let's see. Delta S or For four in the left to two in the left. Mm, I'm trying to run out of space. I apologize for this space. So uh, this is going to be. Final entropy, initial entropy, So my final state had 6 out of 16, so that's my W value. My initial state had 1 over 16. If you have two natural logarithms with minuses in them, what can you do with them? You can divide them. So had we used the 6 and the 1, really the 16s <laughs> cancel out when you divide them in. Anyway, well, if you do this, you get little k. Natural logarithm of that is 1.79. You get 1.67 times 10 to the minus 22. per microstate Kelvin. We just calculated the difference in entropy between those two states. Uh, Kate and then uh, Aaron. When you say four in the left, two in the left, what do you mean by two in the left? Oh, see how in each of these states there's two? And you'll see that on the previous slide too. Aaron? Uh, is there like a shorter way? Oh, is there a shorter way to make, write microstate? You know how you write micrometer with that symbol? Yeah, you can write microstate. Any other questions? How do we feel? So now we've just done the calculation. I don't know if that solidified anything. If we'd done it for this with zero in the left, we would have gotten the same answer. I don't know. Anyway, well. Question, Hannah? So we're getting joules per microstate Kelvin. So can you kind of like, ex 
explain what that means, like we're comparing these two. The, le one, the one on the left with the four, four in the left, is less probable than the microstates on the right, but our, um, our answer, I'm just kind of trying to like understand what 1.67 times 10 to the negative one is. Okay, so what, it, what is this number and what do the units mean? Okay, first thing, this number is positive, that means that the final state has more entropy, matter is more dispersed. And again, that just comes back to this idea that it has more possible states. Okay. Then this number I wouldn't worry too much about. What will happen is when we get back to mole-sized amounts, like if this would you know, multiply this times 10 to the 23rd, we actually get numbers that matter. So this is an example with a few particles where the entropy just, we're just showing that it increases, we're showing how to calculate it. And then the units, well, joules per Kelvin, this is fun, as temperature increases, we will see that makes the particles more dispersed as well. And so there's a positional dependence of entropy and there's a temperature or speed dispersion we haven't gotten to yet, but that's where that per Kelvin is gonna end up, okay? Um, oh, and lastly what I'll say, there are entire PhD theses written on dispersal of matter starting with one particle, then going to two particles, then going to three, similar, starting with one water molecule, going to two water molecules, showing the positions of those, and you can, and this is really cool, and, and they're starting to, by the way, like you might say, well, why, why the hell does that matter? Well, now they're at the point that they can do positional dependence of proteins because they have powerful enough computers starting with one atom at a time and looking at how many positions that is. And so protein folding is a huge issue that they're, starting, that they're tackling starting with one atom at a time. But before you can get two atoms or two particles, you gotta have one down. No, it's delta H, no, it's delta S. No, based on its positions and its bonding. Anyway, so that's, that's why this is, is actually useful in the bigger sense. Because now they can apply it to problems like protein. So anyway, the, but, and it's, in physics, it's like when you start with one atom or even smaller, I think, in physics. It's more or less called ab initio calculation, starting from nothing. Travis, is that part of Z chemistry? Is that part of Z chemistry? Zepto chemistry? Zepto chemistry? You know, uh, good question. I don't know. Okay. Zepto is tinier than femto, isn't it? Yeah. So I think this is bigger than that. Like this okay. is, we're starting on the atom scale. And atoms are in nanometers and tenths of nanometers. And that's enough for most of what we do. And I have to say, almost all of thermodynamics was developed before they knew about atoms. They were theorizing that they existed and thinking about their states. And then, so I would guess not, but I'm not exactly sure. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, the farthest I've gotten is femto seconds and things like that. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Yeah, Logan. You so I, I'm understanding the difference in probability between, you know, four and one versus two and two. Um, can you help us get to the point of understanding how it becomes basically a law that things will disperse equally instead of a probability? How does the probability get so extreme that we would expect never to find anything yeah. other than equal quantities? Let's talk about 20 particles then. Yeah. And so, going there already, huh? yes, it's <laughs> like you guys are, you guys are perfect. You're, uh, so. Okay, so now let's go to 20, because it's still not moles, but let's look at the statistics of 20, and we won't calculate these. I will present the results, and the results will look like this. So. 20 in one versus none in the other, still one microstate.
And I'm going to start using microstate as well. That's the mu for microstate. 10 particles and 10 particles. Well, there are 184,756 microstates. You should see all the sheets of paper I have at home to prove. No. <laughs> there are formulas for this stuff too. So this is just for 20 particles. And it's that much more probable to get a 50-50 split than 20 and 0. Then you put a mole in there, and it goes up exponentially. Or truly, I think the word is factorially, which is a pretty much exponential. So eventually you can add up all microstates, except for the middle one, and they're insignificant compared to the Yes, that is exactly true. So, uh, and I'll say that um, just to make sure everybody heard it. In the end, if you get any realistic number of particles, such as a mole, the only state that exists is the evenly dispersed state. Um, conclusion. And actually, uh, I should check my notes more. It says that, too, in here. Conclusion. Evenly distributed or dispersed matter is most likely, or vastly most likely, Vastly more likely and has highest entropy to exist. And in fact, way back in the day when I first started teaching Chem 401, one of the discussion assignments was literally to have students bring in 100 pennies and flip them 100 times and count up how many heads and how many tails they got and prove even for 100 how narrow the distribution is around 50-50. Sure, 50-50 was the biggest one. It's true, 49 and, 4, and 51 was also relatively high and then it just pretty much went straight down for even 100 particles. Anyway. It's, uh, so it's, it's really, really narrow around evenly distributed dispersed. Travis? So entropy goes down and it gets closer to zero. Oh, um, entropy goes down as you get to zero Kelvin because they don't have as much freedom to move. They don't have to be perfectly ordered at zero Kelvin. There still can be entropy. However, the defined state of perfectly ordered, no motion, that combination leads to zero entropy. Yeah, in fact, most, so not that you can get to zero Kelvin anyway, but if you could, a lot of things would still be um, not have zero entropy because they wouldn't be perfectly ordered. <coughs> okay, any more questions about that? Maybe we're getting there, maybe we're not. Hopefully we are. The most dispersed state, well, we have another example coming up anyway. Let's tackle that one next. Mass dispersal and temperature. And this really gets, uh, starts to talk about the Boltzmann distribution of kinetic energies for a gas. We saw that they were very dispersed. There was a distribution, of course, too. Uh, 
Except now, uh, three atoms, as well, so mass dispersal and temperature. Let's put In this case, total energy will be constant. And the question is, how is that energy distributed? Three atoms have four possible energy values at a given total energy of three units. Which energy configuration has the highest entropy, the most number of microseconds? Well, these three all have two uh, particles atoms, if you will, with zero and the other with three. I'm saying all three of these are microstates with the total, so equal energy, and these are all uh, one uh, type of microstate. Then we have these microstates, which have one at energy level two, one at energy level one, and one at energy level zero. And then there's a third type that has all of them out. What I'm going to suggest to you now is that the most microstates has the highest energy, sorry, highest entropy. It has the highest number of possible microstates. And further, that it has the most, or let's see, it has uh, atoms in the most different types of energy levels. Most different uh, energies. And that this means that energy likes to disperse itself. So if you could have two different types of energies, three different types of energies, or one different type of energy for your particles, that this one will be the one with the highest entropy. Matter likes to disperse itself to the most different types of energies of energy. And that a Boltzmann distribution is equivalent to this except on a macro scale. The particles take as many different energy states as possible. So related to Boltzmann distribution, And the Boltzmann distribution was fraction of particles versus kinetic energy, and they were widely distributed. James, question? So if you had the, the no ones, if you had one in the top and then one of the other ones empty, would that be the same level of energy as what's shown there, or is it different? So let me see if I understand your question. If I had one of these particles up here, yeah. it would have to be this state because the total energy is three. So as soon as you have one particle in three, the other ones have to be in zero energy. Okay. These are, okay. this comes back to that, I've been saying entropy, the number of energetically equivalent microstates. And we can think of this too, total energy is set. How do you distribute it? Right, and 
And when we did Boltzmann distributions, we said kinetic energy was proportional to temperature. Temperature sets the distribution, or sort of how much total energy there is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? That's probably On that second one, the one you say that has the most possible. Yes. Some of them are mirrored exactly the same as you were doing that little last one. How come here it's going to be like the same state? Okay. So, exact, so this is similar to the last one. If we say, like the dots or like the atoms that you're referring to, mm -hmm. don't hit the same points like how we were looking at them before. I mean, they are in the same levels, but they're not in the same points. So this microstate might be called one atom with energy two, one atom with energy one, and one atom with energy zero. Okay. And then all of these would be the same type. Okay. That's how they're the same. Okay. And I get that that's a process. Yeah, the way we were looking at it before with a class, you said 2 2, but then when we drew all them out ourselves, ah. we didn't mirror each other exactly the same. I thought it mattered. It, doesn't ma it didn't matter which two were on the left and which two were on the right, just like it doesn't matter which one's on the top or which one's on the bottom. So they're, they are similar. Now, okay, one more minute. I apologize. <laughs> what do you have to know for the exam? Pick the choice with the most states, microstates, ways of putting them in. Those will always be the ones with the highest entropy. Done. Thank you for your attention. We'll keep working on this. It's a, just a second.